afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Discovery Day at Home. And it's a, a real pleasure to, to be able to, to welcome today Dr. Emma Weinel, um, who's going to talk to us about her career in neuroscience. Um, just to say a little bit about Discovery Day at Home, it's brought to you by Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden. We are um, an independent charity here in the heart of rural Gloucestershire in Berkeley, and we celebrate the life and legacy of Edward Jenner, the, the pioneering Gloucestershire scientist who, amongst many other things, is now perhaps best known for his discovery of vaccination. Uh, normally we try and bring uh, a, a kind of science festival day in the garden of Dr. Jen's house, bringing a bit of science back to back to the birthplace of vaccination. This year we thought we'd try and put it all online and um, spread it over the course of two days. This, this whole event has been supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, and as part of emergency funding designed to see museums through the, the immediate crisis. But I should just add, we, we are, as I say, an independent charity. We are responsible for, um, visitors are responsible for about 70% of our, our income. And at the moment we have no visitors and it's, it's looking like it's gonna be a, a difficult situation for, for quite some time to come. If you're enjoying Discovery Day, if you want to support our work, um, which is caring for the birthplace of vaccination, but also encouraging people into, into science and to think about science careers, then you can do so on our website, jennamuseum.com forward slash discovery day. As I say, all of the events are free this weekend. Uh, don't feel obliged to, to chip in, but if you are in a position to, to make a donation, um, then that would be very much appreciated. But we do know that, that times are hard for everyone at the moment. So with that, um, with that charitable donation pitch done, it's now time to introduce Dr. Emma Wynell. Um, Emma, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, it's great to be with you in a virtual sense, um, coming from Cardiff today. Um, so we're actually entering lockdown in Cardiff this evening. So it's great to be with you um, online because that's the best way we can do things at the moment, isn't it? Well, thank you for, thank you for giving up your Sunday to, uh, to spend it with, with us ahead of your, your 6 p.m. curfew tonight. Um, I wonder perhaps if you could just, just tell us a little bit about, about yourself and, and what you do, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually grew up in Gloucestershire, um, but then I decided to come to Cardiff to study for a degree, uh, actually in biochemistry. So I, at school, I really like biology and chemistry. So I decided to throw the two together and do a biochemistry degree. And that went incredibly quickly. Those three years um, at Cardiff University flew by. Decided I really liked being a student and I really liked studying. So I went on to do a higher degree, a PhD, uh, looking at Huntington's disease, which is a brain disease, um, which is quite rare, but for those people that it does affect it, it can be really absolutely devastating. Uh, and then I went from the lab into the patient clinic. So working with people and families who were impacted by Huntington's disease. And now uh, I'm a lecturer still in Cardiff after 10 years. <laughs> um, I came along to Cardiff and I loved it and I've, I've never left. So that's kind of a summary of, of what I've been up to over the past 10 years or so, really. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, would you say that there's a, a typical day in terms of, of what you do in terms of your, your work and at the university? Is there anything like a normal day? Not really, to be honest. Um, that's one of the reasons I really love the job that I do, it is incredibly varied. So I can go from teaching in normal times about 500 students in lectures um, to go into chat to families and, and patients. And I also do quite a lot of science communication work. So for me, it's really important that we get the scientific message out there. I know that's um, a lot of your work as well, Owen. Um, and it's really important that lots of people are aware of science and have an opportunity to learn about it. Brilliant. And we'll definitely go on, um, I think, to talk a bit more about science communication later. I should have said at the start, if anyone's watching this and they have got some questions for Emma, this is the opportunity. This is going out live and um, this is your opportunity. So please, if you're on YouTube, drop them into the, the live chat box. Uh, otherwise, you can tweet them to us. Uh, tweet them to us using the hashtag discover jenna you can um, email us info at edwardjenna.co.uk find us on facebook uh, send us a carrier pigeon however you want to get your questions to, to emma do send them in um, and we'll be very uh, pleased to, uh, to to share them um, but until we do have some questions coming in I, I wonder perhaps if if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, was there a well i suppose first of all 
what is neuroscience? Yeah, so neuroscience, um, when people hear the word neuroscience, um, really it's all about the brain and how the brain um, interacts with the body and controls the body. But it's quite interesting because I am often referred to as a neuroscientist, um, but I came to neuroscience quite late actually because I started off over in biochemistry. I've always really loved science. Um, and when I did my PhD, I kind of ventured into the brain and, and what the brain does in health and disease. Um, but neuroscience is really all about the workings of the brain, the behaviors that it causes. And also we can go right down into the kind of molecular neuroscience. So looking at the chemicals in the brain and what they're doing all the way up to human behaviors and everything in between really. So neuroscience is a really broad um, field or subject and it's got lots of different elements to it. Was there a, a moment where you thought, right, this is it, I want to be a, a neuroscientist? I don't think so, actually. Um, I think a, a lot of people find with careers, well, I've certainly found that you kind of just go where the opportunities are. Um, so for me, when I was looking for PhDs and to study um, PhDs, I applied for probably about 30, um, lots of which I didn't even get a reply um, from, sadly. Um, but the, the opportunity came up to do a PhD on Huntington's disease, and then I, I took it and kind of ran with it, really. So for me, it was quite a big change to go from biochemistry to neuroscience. Um, certainly within the first few months, that was a, a bit of a shock, really. Um, but I think it's just about reminding yourself that, you know, the people that have chosen you to do that have obviously um, chosen you for a reason and they believe you can do it. So it was a steep learning curve. Um, but yes, I'm really glad that I did it because I think it diversifies what you're able to do and what you can offer. Is there, do you remember anything particularly about it? Was, you said it was a steep learning curve. Is there any particular changes or, or kind of ways of thinking that you had to get used to? Yes, yeah, so I think with neuroscience, there are lots of words and phrases. So different sciences have different um, kind of dictionaries, really. So I remember very early on sitting in a, a meeting and kind of noting down, must look up this word, must look up this word. So there are kind of unique languages that we use in science. Um, so there, there are lots of different words um, that we use. So I think it was really just getting the basics there um, so that I could build on them for the whole of the, the three year PhD that I did. If we can go back in time a little bit. So you're from Gloucestershire. Um, Edward Jenner was from Gloucestershire. And um, we, we obviously we, we absolutely love to see people from Gloucestershire going and, and studying science and pursuing science careers. Uh, what were you studying at school and how did you get into the, into science? Yeah, so I, um, I'll shout out to Chosen Hill School. Um, so I went to Chosen Hill School back, back in the day and really loved science. Um, back when I was studying kind of GCSEs, we studied quite a few GCSEs and I really loved biology predominantly. Um, but in terms of my A-levels, I studied biology and chemistry. And the third one was a bit tricky. Um, there were lots of things I could have done, but I chose to study philosophy and ethics, which might to some people sound like a bit of an interesting mixture, but actually philosophy um, and ethics, so the way that we make our decisions um, and the way that we think about the world has actually been incredibly useful to me. Um, when I chose my A-levels, I was really keen to do more of a subject that included more essays and um, a different way of thinking. And particularly with a lot of the patient stuff that I've done subsequently, ethics um, and what is right and what is wrong are certainly lots of decisions um, that I've kind of looked back on my A-level in philosophy and ethics and think, oh, you know, that, that was a really useful thing to do. And I wanted to talk to you a bit more about ethics, actually, because I know it is a, a major part of your work and it's something we've spoken about in the past. Um, I, I suppose you're looking then very much for because uh, you're also admit an admissions tutor aren't you is that right yeah yes, that's perfect. right yeah um, so everyone that comes to university applies um, and then we have lots of ad admissions staff and we make a decision on your application whether we can offer you a place or not so are you looking then for um, perhaps people who have got that more 
well-rounded education i remember when i was i was at school we were always told if you want to go into science you just study straight science and maybe a bit of maths or something like that but actually it sounds as if the the ethics side of things is is really important yeah so i think it's important to say that we judge kind of every application individually um, and some people have a really strong scientific application, which is great, whereas others have that more rounded application, which is also great. I think it depends really on the person. Um, and certainly, if you're kind of looking at what to do, what to study, I just kind of went with what I enjoyed um, and what I liked, because I think that's so important. And when I was doing my A-levels, I really remember, you know, studying almost the facts and the kind of um, frameworks and the knowledge that you get in biology and chemistry and then I'd kind of move over to philosophy and it was a lot more about the way we're thinking arguments and reasoning and judgment and they are quite different skills um, and I think they're really important to have and um, so if you are kind of looking for going on to make an application to study at university I'd say um, it's, it's really about selling yourself and appreciating all of the skills that you do have and sometimes that could be really tricky so it might be worth asking your teachers or your parents about you know how you can sell yourself in that application really so i think there are lots of different ways you can do that i mean we look for real interest and passion in the subjects um over and above what you would have in school really so whether you've gone to any events like this are a great way to to demonstrate that that you've really gone the extra mile if you like to demonstrate that you really want to pursue this career and that's why you're you're applying to study it how do you go about choosing a, a university how did you end up at cardiff oh yes university choosing um it's really hard isn't it to choose a university i think um so i looked at lots of different universities up and down the country and um, i found when i visited cardiff i just love the city um cardiff i'm sure lots of people have been if you haven't you should come when it's appropriately safe to do so um cardiff is lovely it's a quite a small city obviously the capital of Wales so lots of great things happen here and um, if you've got kind of tours and concerts they come to Cardiff and um, lots of fun sport things so rugby is, is a key to Cardiff culture really um, but for me it was really about that balance and it is important to have a balance between the study and the social side of things um, because studying is obviously important and um, if you come to university you're paying um, tuition fees to do so so you want to get something out of it academically but for me I also wanted that balance um, between the study and all of the other things that university life brings and offers really. How did you get into moving moving on slightly just to, to touch on science communication how did you how did you get into that? Mm. Yeah so science communication it's a phrase that's kind of popping up lots and lots recently and really by that we mean just telling people about science so that can be through all sorts of different ways podcasts talk science writing as a way of communicating science um but for me it really kind of kicked off if you like when i um was really lucky to be able to go to the huntington's disease patient clinic and talk to patients and families about their condition and how they were managing and the research opportunities that we had in the clinic. Um, but something that became really apparent was that lots of the people and the families in clinic, they weren't necessarily familiar with the science behind their disease. And sometimes that wasn't necessarily through lack of trying, it was because the information wasn't presented in a way that was understandable and relatable to them. So for me, it was about meeting that need um, with those people, but also about um, increasing awareness and understanding of Huntington's disease, because our patients were in a space where they felt like people weren't aware of their condition and it was having such a huge and often devastating impact upon their lives and the lives of their children and their whole families. It was really important for me to go and tell people about Huntington's disease so that more people were aware of it. You spoke earlier about the, what, your step up to, to studying Huntington's disease was, was learning the lingo, you know, finding out the, the, all the different terms. How do we go about um, demystifying the science? 
Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I think science is innately, there are some complexities to science and it's important to remember that. Um, I think we just need to look at the language that we're using and sometimes language means different things to different people. So for example, something that's come up recently is arms of a trial. So arms of a clinical trial. And I think to most people, arms are the things that we have part of our body, right? They are, you know, what we have, we have two arms. In a clinical trial, that means two groups. One often has the treatment and one has maybe a placebo, um, a kind of fake to, to control for the drug. Um, so I think we need to be careful about the language that we use. I also think we need, as a kind of scientific community, to be, um, probably a bit more open and honest so I that's another reason why I do lots of science communication work is to prove to people that lots of different people can be scientists it's not just about people sitting in labs um, and not talking to other people it's about scientists being accountable so that they can answer questions about their science and um, more important now than ever I think that we are able to have that dialogue and be challenged um, and reason and, and justify and discuss the decisions that we make and the, the science that we're doing. Do you think that science is, is under particular scrutiny at the moment? Absolutely. I think, well, science is really important to all of our lives. It always has been, but at the moment with the pandemic, it's much more relevant to all of us. Um, I think that there are lots of difficulties um, and you should never really see science alone um, science feeds into politics and politics feeds into science for example and science has never been more important but it's also about everybody kind of realizing understanding that even science doesn't give us um, concrete answers all of the time about scientific progress and you know what we knew about for example, Huntington's disease, the gene for Huntington's disease was discovered in 1993. So before that, we, we knew a lot less about the condition. So it is about this progress. You know, we're never stood still in science and science can sometimes provide answers, but there's often a lot of answers that we still need. Um, lots more science, a lot more research to answer. That's why we do research to answer um, questions eventually, but that scientific knowledge evolves over time and changes as well and you've 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 obviously worked in a, a clinical setting you've spent a lot of time working with with patients and their families i suppose for for anyone um wanting to to look at going down a clinical route do you have any kind of science communication tips for them yeah so it's an interesting career path really because i'm not a medical doctor i'm a, a scientific doctor and that's a really important thing to point out um, and it can get quite confusing if you're working in a clinical setting but you're not a medical doctor um, for me it was really about working with those colleagues and have having really good relationships with the clinical people and the non-clinical people um, for me i think because i was a scientist coming into the clinic Perhaps, arguably, I did have a little bit more time to talk to patients and families, so I wasn't necessarily constrained by that appointment time. Um, I think it's really about working together. So in terms of medicine, you've got scientists that contribute to medicine, engineers, um, biomedical engineering is amazing. You can see all these um, fantastic inventions that engineers come up with for example there's lots around um, limbs and movement and bionic joints and really fantastic things like that so although it is a little bit different i think it's important um, because i think we can all learn a lot from each other and certainly when we've had um, medical students come to the school of biosciences where i lecture and um, the medical students and the, the medical professionals can learn a lot from the science as well so i really think it's a really nice two-way interaction absolutely and and we talk so much about different disciplines being stuck in their own silos it's actually really refreshing to hear you talk about particularly in the medical community where i think it was something that Dr. Susie Lishman was mentioning yesterday in terms of, uh, you know, sometimes people refer to her as being just a pathologist, but actually pathologists are at the heart of, of every different medical discipline. So it's it's really interesting to hear about the, the way that, that science and medicine can work together as well. Do you, do yeah. you, oh, sorry. No, so it's that, that just, that phrase just is often used, isn't it? Oh, you know, you're just a neuroscientist. And I think 
I am a neuroscientist, but I also have that background in biochemistry and I do bits and bobs of science communication. And I think we all bring unique um, backgrounds to what we do. So, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, but another neuroscientist may view things completely differently because of um, their background, their experiences or their career. So I think yeah, we, we bring all sorts of different attributes to the careers that we have. Um, and that's important to recognise as well. About thinking about some of the, your, your achievements in the world of science communication. I mean, you, you've spoken at the Hay Festival. You've uh, been a FameLab finalist. You've given the British Science Association Charles Darwin Award lecture. Um, is there anything that, that particularly stands out as being a, a highlight? Oh, gosh, tough question. Um, for me, I think the Charles Darwin lecture was great because um, we really had an amazing opportunity to bring our science to the British Science Festival. And I spoke about Huntington's disease and some of the ethical challenges that that presents. Um, and I had this washing line with lots of genes and there were some interesting puns around genes and genetics and things. Um, but it, it brought science to new audiences and for me the audience was just so diverse it was amazing I mean we had people who were probably in their 80s we had children that had come from schools we had family members and patients in there so there's a really nice um, diversity to that audience and I think for me it's also about bringing science to people that don't even necessarily know that they're interested in science because if you are going to a science festival you probably know that you like science already, right? Whereas if you are maybe just walking along the streets of Cardiff and I pop up in Cardiff Science Festival and show you some cool kind of sciencey magic tricks, that sparks a whole different um, interest really and gets those people that maybe didn't have such a great time at school in terms of their science, get some thinking about it and the fact that they actually science is for them and it, it might be something that they're interested in. Are there any particularly memorable conversations that you've had in terms of, of interacting with non-scientists? Yes, yeah, so I think some of the interactions I've had um, with patients, just the fact that people are doing research to try and help them. So certainly that was something that I found incredibly rewarding when I was working in the clinic was the sense of kind of gratitude that people show and express and I had a particular um, study that I was working on which was looking at computer games and whether they might be helpful for people living with Huntington's disease and we had a particular patient who was playing the computer games and said that he had um, really gained a lot of confidence in terms of taking part in a study and coming to terms with his diagnosis and he was um, had just signed up to a university degree because he'd gained such a lot of confidence so that was really amazing for me. I think as well, even just in terms of the general public um, dialogue about Huntington's disease, I said earlier, for me, it's about increasing that awareness and understanding as well, um, because there are lots of people who aren't aware of Huntington's disease. And I can understand that because it's a relatively rare condition, but for those it does affect, um, it, it is really important. It's core to their, their lives. and. Um, you know, I've, I've heard horror stories about people going to their GP and their GP says, oh, you know, I've not heard of Huntington's disease. And I'm, ah, everybody should know about Huntington's disease. Um, or at least if they don't have the kind of confidence to go and read up about it and have access to resources that are written in an uh, appropriate way so that, you know, there's nothing worse is there when you try and like research something and the language is just so dry and complicated and you just don't know where to start. So I think it's about building that up um, so that it appeals to different audiences. Where do you think is a good place to start if people did want to know more about um, Huntington's disease? Is there yes. anything you recommend? So HD Buzz, so H-D-B-U-Z-Z, -Z, um, is a fantastic resource that has been created via um, Ed Wild and Jeff Carroll. So they basically spotted that there was a really big need to make especially research into Huntington's disease much more accessible. So they have a fantastic website, they do podcasts and things. 
And the Huntington's Disease Association um, of England and Wales, and there's a, a Scottish equivalent and a Northern Ireland equivalent and an Irish equivalent. Um, they are charities that work with patients and families as well. So they have fantastic um, resources available for further information as well. I know that your um, TEDx talk uh, recently was about um, the, the ethics of, of um, the, the genetics behind it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So Huntington's disease is um, quite a unique condition because it is caused by um, a single faulty gene. And in terms of Huntington's disease and the neuroscience behind it, it's really rare for that to happen, which means that there are opportunities in terms of research and potential future treatments. Um, we know in Huntington's disease, that if you carry the gene for the condition, there's a 50% chance that you might pass it on to your children. Um, there is no association with gender or anything like that. So it's just a, people often describe it as a flip of a coin, that 50-50 chance of passing that on. Um, we speak a lot about um, ways in which you can have children, but they aren't necessarily at risk of passing on that gene. So things like pre-implantation genetic diagnoses and ways in which if people are aware of their risk of having Huntington's disease, that they can have children, um, but prevent that gene from passing on. Um, the way their genetics works, it doesn't skip generations or anything like that. It goes through uh, every generation. And unfortunately, Huntington's disease does lead to fatality. Um, on average, about 10 to 15 years after the diagnosis, so after people show these shaking-like movements, uh, and it often leads to fatalities in the, the 50s or 60s, although we often speak in kind of averages, don't we, in science. And there are, there are people who are living with Huntington's disease into their 80s, um, for example. So it is quite a unique condition to the individual as well. Um, and that's certainly something that I experienced in clinic. You know, you read about a condition in a textbook, don't you? But the reality of it um, for patients and families is, is very different. So some people show a lot of psychiatric problems. Other people show a lot of problems with their movement and less psychiatric, for example. So that's a fascinating thing about the condition. You know, it's caused by the same genetic fault, but it's causing such different symptoms in different people. So that's an ongoing area of research for lots of people, um, but quite an interesting feature as well. Do you think there's a, a place in society for a, a kind of greater dialogue about um, ethics in, in medicine and particularly in terms of, of just talking about diseases a bit more? Absolutely. I think that, unfortunately, when we are, as people, confronted with these really difficult um, ethical challenges and questions, there are often things that you won't necessarily have thought of before. So not only is that a kind of tricky experience to go through, you might feel under pressure or rush, you won't have even necessarily thought of these questions before. Um, Huntington's disease has lots of ethical dilemmas and questions, so things like whether you would want to know if you carry the gene for the condition, whether you would want to have children, or whether you would want to go about having children in a different way so that you don't pass that gene on. I think ultimately these ethical challenges and questions Often people think, oh, you know, the, the medical people will deal with that. They'll just tell me the right thing to do. But actually, it's not down to them. That's your life. And it's it's the decisions that you're going to have to make. And admittedly, kind of with the appropriate support and guidance from the, the relevant professionals. But ultimately, it is going to be your decision. And um, so that's why I think we need a lot more honesty and, and open dialogue about the pros and cons. And also the fact that different people make different decisions and that is absolutely fine you know there isn't necessarily the right decision um, and I think we need a lot more tolerance particularly today that different people have different views for different reasons and that is okay it's okay to accept that those views are different and there isn't necessarily a right or, or a wrong view there. Thank you uh, and I wanted to talk to you about um conscious that that we've we've got questions coming in i i uh, we could talk about huntington's disease all day but um i could i'd like to move on to talk about um perhaps diversity in in um in science and particularly um 
we've had a question about um is it still the case that far fewer women are studying stem degrees at university and and how do we encourage young women into stem subjects mm, so the lack of um Girls and, and young women in STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, or maths, has been a problem. It's a problem that's been recognised for quite a while now. And there have been lots of initiatives or um, kind of schemes to get more women and girls into studying science um, at all of the different levels of science. So um, at the moment, you see that typically at university, it's about a 50-50 split in terms of um, male female gender about biosciences um, what we do see and we continue to see throughout the kind of career trajectory is that um, women kind of fall off um, you see a lot less women um, particularly after degree level so PhD further study lecturers um, professors is incredibly low um, if you look at the kind of literature behind that that probably coincides with the fact that careers in science are unstable um, and particularly if you wanted to plan a family it can be quite tricky in terms of literally funding that whether you'll be eligible for things like maternity leave um, is a problem so for me I think there's been lots of fantastic work around getting more girls and, and women involved um, in STEM subjects and I think there's still more to do in that area, but I think we've started it, which is fantastic. For me, there's an issue around retaining the fantastic women that we have um, so that we don't lose incredibly talented people that have had years of education and years of fantastic um, tutoring and, and education so that we don't lose them. I mean, that sounds like it, it's it's a significant issue and probably one that's that's quite deeply embedded um, how do you go about starting to not not you personally but how how do, do we as a society um start to to go about sorting that yeah um oh, yes and if we had the answer then that would be fantastic i think we do need to look at the way science works the way that we support women um in scientific careers so things like flexible working but not only saying that you're going to be supporting flexible working genuinely supporting it and um, we need to look right the way down the career trajectory and you know there's a lot to be said about role models and you know that phrase you can't be what you don't see comes up a lot um, but also you know i have faced criticism previously for my science communication work um, you know, and things like, you know, why are you doing that, et cetera, et cetera. But the, that, you know, is really important to me. Um, and one of the reasons I do so much science communication work is to encourage more women and girls into science. I want to encourage everyone into science. Um, but particularly, it really saddens me when, you know, the, the classic draw a scientist experiment that often pops up. Um, so if you, if you are watching, draw a scientist and send us your um, pictures, because I'd be really interested to know what they look like, um, because people often draw stereotypical scientists. So it's about challenging those stereotypes. Um, so that science is a, a more viable um, career for lots of people. And you know, genuinely, so that they can balance things like families. Um, and also, I think that that benefits everybody, not only women, but I think that benefits men as well. Because if if the society is different in terms of that, then they you know have a, a better working relationship and working environment, so that they can make the most of their life as a whole as well. Is there any um, particularly good examples of? Um work going on in in schools just in terms of um yeah in in terms of, of engaging people in general but but particularly young women yeah so the stem ambassador network have got fantastic resources available online they ran a really successful um workshop that was called people like me where they got lots of different um people from a range of careers to come into schools and um, they tended to choose um, jobs where the person would have kind of something covering their face so they had a firefighter they had um, I think it was a mechanic with a helmet over their face a, a doctor with lots of masks and they talked to these kids about careers and when they kind of unveiled themselves they were all women um, but lots of the audience didn't necessarily predict that and it was about you know if you want to be a mechanic 
you can be a mechanic. You know, it's, it's that kind of narrative. And at the same time, I do think we need to be um, honest and discussing from a young age that, yes, we have these inherent biases and they're not correct and you should be whatever you want to be. But there might still be some hurdles. There might be some struggles. You know, wouldn't want anybody to to think it was easy. It's, it's not easy. But in doing that, we kind of um, overcome them. And the more we overcome them, I, I hope that the hurdles are uh, lesser for the future generations to come. And you're the Equal Opportunities and Diversity representative on the uh, British Neuroscience Association Committee. I had to write that down in front of me, so <laughs> I got it mouthful, right completely. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about your work there, please? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I do a lot of work in terms of um, gender equality, but equality of all sorts. So we know that unfortunately, um, neuroscience does tend to be quite white in terms of a discipline and quite male um, dominated. So we are trying to do a lot more in terms of increasing the diversity on every level, um, in terms of ethnicity and gender, um, just so that that kind of stereotypical scientist or neuroscientist isn't the case anymore and how we can do that whether that's through um schemes that encourage people into neuroscience or retain the, the great neuroscientists that we've got um, there are a lot of cultural issues that we need to explore so even the way that people put themselves forward for um positions or jobs or opportunities whether they nominate themselves which I think most people hate, don't they really, if we're honest about it, the self-nomination process, or whether it's other people that nominate you. And even that has issues though, doesn't it? Because if you don't know anybody that wants to nominate you, it can be a bit tricky. And, you know, we see this particularly in medicine, actually, but in lots of disciplines, um, you see a kind of family trajectory of, you know, everybody's a, a doctor, but really it's, it shouldn't be about that. It shouldn't be who you know. It should be about what you can bring to the table and what you're interested in and what you love. So I think the more we can do around that, um, the better, really. Um, that being said, it is a, a struggle. There's lots to do in that area, um, but we are progressing. And, you know, I think we, we will get there. Um, it might take a while, but the more people we can have on board and the more people that we have behind that, I think that's a great thing. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh we could we could talk about again we could talk about this all day as well i'm sure um i'm conscious that we're we're sort of fast running out of of time really um so just just to um obviously remind if anyone wants to ask their questions to emma please do um send them into us now um or um you may lose that opportunity but um in the meantime um perhaps have you got a favorite science fact Oh, wow. A favourite science fact. Gosh. Um, I've got a favourite science experiment. Go for it. So my favourite science experiment, something I did recently for the Global Science Show, and it's all about why you brush your teeth and how toothpaste is important in terms of brushing your teeth. So if you get two eggs and cover one in toothpaste, and leave the other one just fine and then put them both in vinegar overnight so the acidity from the vinegar is gonna um, degrade the eggshell the one that has a toothpaste the toothpaste should protect it from uh, eroding that eggshell and then after 24 hours take them both out give them a wash and see what they're like and that should demonstrate how toothpaste works I'm gonna go and do that well, not right now, but uh, in, just be careful minute. about bouncing those eggs because it can get a bit messy. Is there anything that about the, um, I suppose, anything about the brain or anything about the human body that still surprises you after after all of your your work and research? Yeah, I think for me, how little we actually know about the brain. So in terms of when you compare it to all the other organs of the body, there's still so much to learn about the brain um, and why we are different to other people. Um, we still are at the kind of very infancy, I think, about understanding the human brain. Um, dispelling some of the myths that we had from the history and when we look at things like phrenology, so this kind of now totally debunked thing about how the lumps and bumps on your skull give you different personality traits for example um, and building on that history but learning more and more about it we still don't know you know 
if we look at neuroscience, how or why, you know, my personality might be different to yours and the underlying neuroscience behind that. Um, and also I think that's important in terms of understanding diseases. So the more we know about the brain in its healthy state, the more that we can apply it to disease so that we can look to help people um, living with brain diseases and disorders. Because I think brain diseases and disorders are still really scary for people, not only the people living with them, but their families as well. Um, certainly from my time working with patients, that was something that came out time and time again. People are understandably terrified about their brain going wrong. You know, your brain is such an important feature of, of you. Um, so for me, I think there's still so much to learn about the brain and, and neuroscience. What do you think are the, um, I suppose, the, the next steps in terms of, of your research and, and research into your field in general? Yeah, so Huntington's disease, um, there is a really exciting clinical trial going on at the moment. And I think it's fair to say that we are closer than we ever have been for a treatment for that condition. That being said, most clinical trials take decades to go from beginning to end successfully. So that is a drug which is administered via lumbar puncture. So um, into the cerebral spinal fluid of, of the spine. So it is quite an invasive procedure. And that drug is literally looking to um, prevent the gene having its impact on the body. So that's now gone to what we call a phase three study. So it's been successful in phase one and phase two, and it's progressing. And um, even the fact that clinical trials take so long, I mean, we've seen this, haven't we, recently around um, the COVID vaccination trials and halting trials is a perfectly normal and sensible and safe thing to do in trials. Um, but in terms of Huntington's disease, I think that that is a really um, important um, milestone. But I also think it's about managing expectation and being honest and realistic um, with patients and families and saying, you know, this is where we're at um, you know this drug might not be suitable for everybody for example but also access is a big issue as well um, for me I think that there could be decades of fantastic science fantastic work that goes into creating new drugs for really horrible conditions but if nobody can access them at the end of that then that is a real problem as well. And do you think there is um phrasing this question carefully do you, do you think um i suppose it goes back to that that discussion about um huntington's disease and, and degenerative diseases in general in society um i guess that a lot of the um the significant interest i guess is with alzheimer's and dementia do you, does that affect the way that the 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 medicines can be accessed is there more research money being spent on on alzheimer's Yes, um, there is. So if you look at it as a proportion, um, Alzheimer's affects more people. So arguably, you could say it should have more money spent on it. But for me, I think there are lessons that we can learn from each of those disorders that help all of the others. So neurodegenerative diseases, diseases where the brain sadly degrades over time, um, and that's slightly different to the normal healthy aging process. So the way that we... Um, allocate funds to that or compete for funding um, to do that different research. And I think it's about recognizing particularly for rare diseases, um, it is a financial argument at the end of the day, isn't it? And you know, whether the money put into this will benefit people. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work that different diseases or disorders can learn from each other so that the you know, if you're researching Alzheimer's disease, yes, you're researching that condition, but are there any lessons that we can learn that we can take over to Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease or all the other um, degenerative conditions as well? We, we're talking obviously quite a lot about COVID-19 at the moment, and, and there is discussion around um, long COVID and, and the, the neurological um, associations with with COVID-19. Um, is there any any research you can talk about in terms of that? Yeah, so COVID and neuroscience is emerging, isn't it? I think um, any kind of longer term 
issues are just going to be a matter of time for me. I think the more immediate concern, certainly for um, the things that I've been seeing is the way that COVID has impacted or, and is continuing to impact the mental health of the nation. Um, we do a lot of work in terms of understanding mental health and mental health conditions. Um, and the fact that ultimately the brain and the way the brain works doesn't like uncertainty and doesn't like change. Um, we are at the end of the day, social creatures and, you know, lockdowns and things like that aren't good for our mental health. Um, and lots of people now will be experiencing things like anxiety for the first time. They might not have experienced um, that before. So it's about managing that as well. So our mental health services as a nation were already stretched. And I know there is lots of discussions at the moment about additional funding for those um, really important resources that are going to be absolutely even more stretched now. So I think it is about... Um, understanding I think it comes back to being open and honest you know having those conversations if if you're feeling anxious and you're having a rubbish day having um the, almost the strength of character to to tell someone and that can be anyone you know your family or your friends or you know even work colleagues I think we should have that recognition that it's it's tough at the moment it is really tough um and the more open and honest we can be about that the better I think that can be sometimes quite challenging if you're the person on the kind of receiving end of that, if you like, you know, how do you respond to that? What do you do? But I think it's really about just providing support and just being there. Often you don't necessarily have to even provide anything. It's just the fact that you're there and you're willing to make that time to listen to someone and to show that you care. So I think for me, um, the COVID effect on the mental health um, of the nation is going to be the main area of research that I think we should be looking mm. at at the moment. We've had a question come in, um, which I'm going to try to view it on my screen. During lockdown, I have binged Grey's Anatomy, says the questioner. This isn't me. Nice. Um, I've been very busy working at Dr. Janet's house and definitely not binging Grey's Anatomy. Um, I'm guessing it's very different in real life, but there the brain surgeons are seen as the rock stars of the hospital. Is there a hierarchy slash snobbery of disciplines in science? Mm, great question. Um, I think there can be. I think it depends very much on where you are. And I think within specialties or disciplines there are obviously individuals um which is important to recognize so i think brain surgery in particular you know even though the expressions we use in daily life you know oh it's not not rocket science not brain surgery kind of contributes to that um so i you know i've got fantastic colleagues who are neurosurgeons that are very down to earth and come and ask me for my opinions on the latest scientific papers and things like that um but i think there is that hierarchy I think there is still that recognition though, right? That even brain surgeons can't do their job unless their gowns are put on, unless their instruments are cleaned by the rest of the team. So whilst that is inappropriately there, I think that it depends on the individual and I think there should be that recognition. And I think certainly in terms of COVID, there has been, hasn't there, in terms of key workers. I mean, who's a key worker? Um, you know, certainly our, our cleaners and our shop people and our carers, medics, um, are all key workers. So I think, again, it comes back to changing those stereotypes, doesn't it really? Um, and also being comfortable enough to challenge them where they exist as well. So, you know, if somebody's putting you in a position that, that you feel uncomfortable in, it's okay to politely say, actually, that makes me feel quite uncomfortable. Can we, you know, talk about that as well? Because often, I think, unless those people are challenged they don't even know that they're making people feel uncomfortable either definitely is there um an element i suppose of of how uh, the the media portrays scientists that feeds into that and i mean i remember yesterday we were again we're talking to dr susie lishman she was she was very keen to stress that in terms of um, uh, a post-mortem, it's, it's a whole team. And, you know, whereas if you're watching Silent Witness, for example, um, other programs are available, you might be tempted to think it's one person doing absolutely everything. Is there a, a I guess, is there, is there a need for the, the way that the media portrays scientists to be reevaluated? 
I think so. I think, unfortunately, in the media, we do still see this classic stereotypical scientist. If, even if you look at some of the key decision makers at the moment, um, typically are white men, but also it's, it's that team science um, rhetoric that we need. And unfortunately, if you look at the way science is maybe rewarded, it is more individual, which I don't think is particularly helpful. Um, but, you know, I couldn't do my research without the amazing admin staff and the finance team that are arranging taxis for, for patients and things like that, arranging their transport. So I think it is about that. I think it's difficult and it's difficult for the media, isn't it? Because if you have casting for a, a show and, you know, you cast secretaries and finance people, um, that could be tricky as well. But I do think it's probably about scientists talking about science as well, right? So if we don't talk about it and encourage that dialogue, um, then I don't think we can necessarily put all of, of the blame on the media. We're coming coming very much to the end of our, our time now. I wonder whether you can give us a quick sort of one minute pitch for neuroscience, please. Oh, wow. Put on the spot. So I love neuroscience. Um, learning about the brain, I just find innately fascinating. Um, we've all got a brain and we should know more about it. We should learn and understand more about it. So whether that's the cells that are in the brain looking kind of really microscopically or whether that's understanding your behaviors, why you feel sad or angry or happy. Um, neuroscience is just an amazing subject and that's why I love um, learning about it. And also all the amazing things that feed into neuroscience. So your genetics play a huge part in the way that your brain functions and your experiences and your environment as well. Um, so neuroscience is amazing. And I love neuroscience in all of its aspects and the way that neuroscience links um, with lots of different scientific disciplines. So if people are inspired by that and want to go and find out more about neuroscience, where's the best place to start? Wow. OK, so the British Neuroscience Association has lots of different neuroscience um, resources and, and packs and things like that. Um, there are lots of different neuroscience um, podcasts that you can just either like Google the brain, search brain in there as a key ter search terms and um, neuroscience is probably a bit broad but brain behavior anything like that um, and really it's just science in general so I think we should probably stop thinking about neuroscience as um, a discipline in itself because it does feed into loads of other disciplines and um, biology and genetics as well so um, loads of popular science books out at the moment and podcasts as well um, I won't name any specifically but have a little look at all of them um, because we have seen this surge actually in terms of popular science um, communications and I think I think to some extent probably lockdown and the the increase in interest in science recently has only gone to um, to push that further and to to get more people out um, communicating obviously you, you use Twitter a lot um, do you find social media to be a, a positive thing um, I do use Twitter a lot, yes. So social media, I think I have found it very helpful um, in terms of connecting. But that being said, you know, I've spoken a lot about mental health it does need to be managed um, appropriately. So I use Twitter predominantly for work. Um, and, you know, that creeps into to social life sometimes. Um, Twitter is unregulated. You need to think, take everything with a pinch of salt. Um, and I think social media we know it has pros and cons but it's about recognizing those and also acknowledging that the person or the message put out on social media is the message that people want you to see that doesn't necessarily reflect the entirety um, of what they're going through at the moment you know nobody wants to kind of moan and, and say how awful they're feeling but it's about normalizing that um you know how many photos that we see on social media aren't heavily edited or cropped etc and that's that is a problem but i think in terms of science um certainly in terms of interacting with different audiences i found social media to be a really good platform and um, to be able to do that that being said i think the the character limits of things mean that you can only um say you know, a, a very short amount of things, can't you? Uh, unless you 
link it to various other platforms so things can sometimes be taken out of context so yeah i love it um but i'm also mindful that it has some disadvantages as well wonderful thank you well we've reached the end of our our time i'm afraid emma so uh, just to say thank you a huge thank you for for giving up your time today to to come and talk to us um and hopefully if people want to find you you're on twitter Yes, I am on Twitter. I'm at Emma Wynell on Twitter. Um, thank you for having me. It's really nice. I'm sad that I couldn't come back to Gloucestershire for the occasion, um, but understandably so. And it's, it's great. I'd be happy to join in the rest of the programme. It's great. It's going on kind of all weekend, isn't it? It is, absolutely. So we've got... Um... Oh, let's try and remember now. In about 20 minutes, we've got Dr. Kate Harvey um, doing a live Q&A about immunology and um, being an immunologist and, and probably the body's immune system. And I'm sure that we will be talking, talking a, a lot, we've got lots of questions about that. Um, at two o'clock, Hannah Ayub is doing a, um, a drawing workshop, a zine and observational drawing workshop. Hannah is an illustrator and science communicator. That's going to be fantastic. Really looking forward to that. And then fi finishing up at four o'clock, we have a cl virtual cloud walk, cloud spotting with uh, Professor Giles Harrison, with Dr. Claire Ryder and Simon King from the BBC Weather Service. And uh, we're encouraging people to send in their photos of clouds and I can't see my window I've got no idea whether it's it's cloudy outside or not but um, we'll be talking clouds and if anyone wants to to take some pictures of clouds send them in to us um, on Twitter Facebook hashtag discover Jenna um, all sorts of things and it's all going to be available online afterwards so if you miss anything go to jennamuseum.com forward slash discovery day and you can catch up for up to 30 days afterwards so no excuses <laughs> Dr. Emma Wynall, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining in at home as well.